I always like to I always like to note to those who are watching that the Historical Society of St. Catharines, we do rely on members and uh, paying members uh, to keep the organization going. So uh, for those who do get a newsletter, we do always put uh, a renewal form in there for those who have been members in the past and have not uh, get the newsletter, but have not renewed. We also, uh, you can also take a look at our website at stcatherineshistory.ca to see more information uh, on that. So again, I want to encourage everyone here who's not already to become a member for those who are members uh, have not uh, signed up for this year. We certainly encourage you to do so. So on that note, I want to lead now um, to our presentation for today. And for that, I will turn the introduction over to Stephanie. Hmm. Uh, good evening, everybody. Tonight, we welcome Brock History Professor, Dr. Elizabeth Vlasic and History MA student Paige Groot as they present on the history of the decommissioned Gardens V Arena. Dr. Elizabeth Vlasic is an Associate Professor of History and the Associate Dean, Research and Graduate Studies for the Faculty of Humanities at Brock University. She holds degrees from Mount Allison University, the University of Oxford, and the University of Cambridge. Her areas of teaching and research expertise include Weimar and Nazi Germany, the cultural history of war, post-war reconstruction, gender and nationalism, public and oral history, and memory in the politics of commemoration. Her most recent publications include articles on Nazi forced labor policies and forced conscription. Over the past few years, Dr. Vlasic has become increasingly interested in connecting local Niagara history to broader global events and in working with the community on public history projects. She is co-director of the Sport Oral History Archive, SOHA, a digital interactive archive preserving local and national sporting legacies through the collection of oral history interviews and photographs. Paige Groot is a graduate student in Brock's Master's in History. She holds honors degrees in history from Brock University and environmental practice from Royal Roads University. Her SSHRC funded thesis project studies late medieval and early modern woodlands in the high wheeled region of Southeast England using historical geographic information systems and historical ecology. Paige is passionate about digital history methodology. We thank you for presenting on the Garden City Arena tonight. And with that, please welcome Dr. Vlasic and Paige Groot. Thank you, Stephanie, for that very kind introduction. And many thanks to the Historical Society of St. Catharines for inviting Paige and me to present on this topic, which I hope um, will be of great interest to many of you. And, and I suspect that many of you already know quite a bit about the Garden City Arena. So what I'd like to do today is share with you a lot of the sort of the process that went into and the planning that went into this project, some of the things that we learned through this project, and then Paige is going to be providing you with some more detail about the work that she did on this project with me and the rest of the class. So I just want to start by explaining, uh, in, in Stephanie's introduction, she mentioned the fact that I am a scholar of Weimar and Nazi Germany primarily. And so you might be wondering how a Nazi Germany expert is working on the Garden City Arena. But as Stephanie also mentioned, I've become increasingly interested in connecting local history to world events and of looking at our local history and at Niagara history through that lens of these larger historical themes and events and connecting it to them. And the reason I started doing this is primarily because I, I teach European history courses. I teach a course on 20th century world history. And I, there were two things that were happening. One was that I've had very few opportunities to get my students working in archives, working with materials, digging into the, the, the work that historians do with primary sources because of language barriers and also geographic barriers. But also I was noticing that a lot of my students didn't, even though they were living in St. Catharines, some of them might actually be from the Niagara region, that very few of them had very uh, deep understanding or any knowledge of local history. And so I wanted to figure out a way to, to get students working on primary sources. So that would mean local sources and working specifically in Brock Special Collections, which is a fantastic resource for our students and, and for, for the community. And, and also thinking about the world that they inhabit, 
the region that they live in now, whether it is the place that they've lived their entire lives or a place that they now call home as students here. And so I was trying to make these connections and I started incorporating more local history, events, places, personalities into my world history course. And in fact, one of the assignments had students researching a local personality, place, event, and then connecting it to uh, one of the broader themes that we were exploring in our world history course. So this oral history project that I wanted to talk to you about is probably one of the most, it is the most ambitious uh, project that I've ever embarked on with a group of students. It was the hardest, it was the most exhausting, it was also the most rewarding, and I am incredibly proud of it, and I'm incredibly proud of my students who were involved in it, and I'm really excited that Paige is going to get to share some of her experiences with you today as well. So just to start off, I'd like to just define what we mean by oral history. And so you can define it as the interviewing of eyewitness participants in the events of the past for the purposes of historical reconstruction. But oral history is a lot more than that, because what it does is it offers a different way of knowing about the past and of writing history. And it also allows groups that have traditionally been excluded from the written historical record to tell their stories as what we call experiential authorities. And so by doing oral history, we get to ask questions that have not been asked and to collect the reminiscences that otherwise would be lost. So two things are happening here with oral history. It's both a methodology, but it's also a source. It's a way of preserving the past, of recording it, but also of also being able to add texture to the way in which we tell stories of the past and that we can then add to written records, archival documents, the sources that we tend to prioritize as historians, the ones that we tend to think of as more truthful or accurate. But these oral histories, these testimonies, the stories of people who experienced these events, who lived through them, their own lived experiences, their own interpretations of how they lived through these things adds this incredible dimension to our understanding of the past. And so for a long time, historians often shunned oral history because it wasn't seen as, as accurate or that people's memory, people have memory lapses. They don't necessarily remember things as accurately as they can. They get dates mixed up or they mix things up. But what oral historians do is they say, well, you know what, that's true. But this also helps us also understand how memory works, how the past is reconstructed in people's memories and their minds. And that as it in itself is really, really fascinating. Why is it that certain things are remembered or forgotten, that certain stories or episodes are valued and privileged over others? The way in which somebody tells their own story, the narrative arc that they choose to tell it in, that's also really, really interesting and very telling and can add more nuance or, or as I said, texture to the way in which we understand and, um, and analyze in, in the, the past. So what I, I was always interested in oral history. I'd never done very much of it in my own research. I had interviewed veterans of the Second World War, but just sort of uh, these very informal interviews, I found it very frustrating, very challenging, and I'd never been formally trained in engaging in oral history. But I always found reading testimonies um, other historians, oral history interviews, to always be a really important part of my own research. And so I'd always been hoping at one point to engage in more oral history. And the opportunity came about for me to do some oral history when I, um, I'm trying to share my screen here. Here we go. Uh, when I became, I, I was always, I've always been interested in public history and the way in which history is told in museums and historic sites and monuments. And this is research that I have, have done in my own, my own work on uh, Nazi Germany, but also I've, I've been trying to figure out ways to incorporate more of this type of public history in my courses. And so I started developing a course back in 2020, a course that I wanted to offer in the fall of 2021, 2020, sorry, the fall of 2020 on uh, public history. And I decided that a really um, exciting opportunity um, arose when Ni Niagara got the Canada Games. And I thought this was a great opportunity for me to figure out a way of creating a, having a student project 
for my class of public, this first iteration of a public history course where my students would work on these projects about the history of the Canada Games. And as I did research on the Canada Games, I discovered that there wasn't all that much about the Canada Games. A lot of the uh, publications or documents were more about stats or um, the economic impact of the games and not on individuals' experiences, on athletes' experiences, organizers, Canada Games Council members, et cetera. And so I started um, reaching out to members of the Canada Games Council who were very helpful in, in saying, well, some of these stories are just in people's memories. This is, uh, they, they, they hold this institutional knowledge. They have these stories to tell. Why don't you interview them? And then those interviews could provide the base, the sources for your students to work on these projects. And the idea was that they were going to build these, uh, these panels, these information panels for the Canada Games. And so I started doing these interviews and realized, gosh, I'm going to be doing all these interviews with people um, and I'm actually engaging in oral history. And so I started to, in, to do a lot more research on methodology and the history of oral history. And I thought, gosh, I'd love to be able to record these and make them available not only to my students, but to the public more generally and to future researchers. And wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a repository where people could listen to these interviews and learn from those who had experienced the games, past games, about um, the history of the games, uh, the impact of the games on communities across Canada. And this is where this project, how this project started, I started interviewing people and this was at the very beginning of COVID. And my own research kind of ground to a halt because I couldn't go anywhere. And I started this new project where I began interviewing people across Canada for this oral history, uh, this Canada Games oral history collection. And I was working on this collection alongside Dr. Julie Stevens from Brock's Department of Sport Management, who was, um, very much involved in the organizing of the Canada Games uh, at, the, at the Brock level. And she uh, was working alongside me and she too started to realize, wow, this is, this is actually really a really exciting opportunity to record these stories. But, but we were also talking a lot about the, that point that I just made about why oral histories are so valuable, that it is so, they are so valuable, especially for communities and groups that have traditionally not had a lot of history written about them and don't have uh, you know, their own written archive. And uh, Professor Stevens is a historian of women's hockey in Canada. And at the time she was working with Library and Archives Canada that had it, uh, had um, decided that they, they really needed to have a women's hockey collection at the National Archives. But there was, was not a lot of material. And so Julie and I started talking about, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could start interviewing the women who were instrumental in the growth of the game? And so alongside my Canada Games project, I started working on this women's hockey project. I also had a student who was looking for a project to do during COVID. And, and I said, well, there might be some other oral history projects that you could work on. And we were, uh, Julie and I were in contact with Ma Rosemary Goodwin in Niagara on the Lake, who was working on a 50th anniversary commemoration of the Niagara on the Lake Tennis Club. And so uh, my student, um, Adam, worked with Rosemary on an oral history collection for the Niagara on the Lake Tennis Club. And as we started creating all these collections, we thought, okay, we need a repository. We're doing all these sports related projects. And this is how the Sport Oral History Archive was born. And so I uh, encourage you all to visit it. And uh, uh, we have a fantastic team of students, uh, past students who've worked on it, who contributed to it. And so this Niagara, uh, this, this uh, Canada Games project, um, to, to make a long story short, this is how a Nazi Germany expert became an oral historian working on the Garden City Arena, which was through these sport projects. But why the oral history, why, sorry, why the Garden City Arena? Well, two things happened. I, what happened with these projects that I was working on, these oral history collections and working with students building these collections was that I wanted to build more collections. I really saw the value for students to work in community, to engage in these kinds of interviews, the, uh, the skill, skill development, um, how, how it was um, uh, being able to integrate that into their, their studies as, as young historians. And I wanted to create more collections, but this is 
very labor intensive. And I was thinking, how can I create more collections? And I thought I'm gonna get students involved in this at, in these classes, actually getting them to build collections, to create collections from the ground up. And so I created a new course, a fourth year honors seminar on oral history, a full year course where I wanted students to have a topic and build, create from, from scratch an oral history collection from start to finish, finding people, interviewing people, recording the interviews, creating a collection, getting it up online, making it navigable, creating exhibits so people can kind of experience these things or, or, or see how they fit together. And I was thinking, gosh, this was in the spring of 2021, I was going to be teaching the course in the fall of 2021. And I thought I need to have a topic. I'd, I'd like something, it has to be sport related so it can go into the sport um, oral history archive. And two things happened. The first was that because I was already working on Canada Games projects and I, I was still working on the Canada Games collection at this time, I was um, doing just curious about what the status of the Canada Games park was because it was delayed in its construction and of course the games were postponed by a year. And one day I just thought, I wonder what's happened to, the, to, that, to that building where it's at. And this article came up that the garden, uh, the Canada Games Centre was going to replace the Garden City Complex. And this was the first I'd heard of it. Of course, I was two years, two years late. I'd, I'd missed the first news that the Jack Gatecliff Arena uh, was going to be closed down once the Canada Games Arena or Canada Games Park was built. And so I thought, gosh, this arena that I go to regularly because my son plays hockey there, it's really close to where I live. I drive past it every day. This building is going to be gone at some point. It's going to be decommissioned and it's going to get torn down. It's going to be gone. Could we somehow do an oral history of a building? Is that possible? Can a building have an oral history? Can a building tell its stories? This, this was in the spring of 2021, about May, June of 2021, when I sort of had that first initial thought of, it's going to be about the Garden City Arena. Then something else happened. The Welland House Hotel burned down in July of 2021. And it was a moment where I was thinking about the, the physical loss of the building. And I was thinking too about how many other buildings St. Catharines has lost over the years. And um, and I think it was, it was an interview that Ad Adrian Petrie from the St. Catharines Museum gave shortly after, I think it was the day after the fire, where he was talking about the history and the, the very rich history of this building and all the stories associated to this building. And he, and he said in passing, gosh, wouldn't it be amazing to interview people who've, you know, musicians who've played um, gigs at this hotel or the people who've, who've uh, stayed there or have, have stories to tell. And I thought, okay, I definitely have to create this oral history um, collection for the Garden City Arena before it's gone because wouldn't have ha wouldn't have it have been amazing if those oral history stories those stories those interviews the story of this building that burnt down if they could have been collected when that building was still there when people could have actually gathered at the building itself on site and shared those stories before it was gone of course we didn't know that it was going to burn to the ground so this is what sort of sparked that desire to record these stories to record the history of the Garden City Arena. But can a building have an oral history? And how does a building tell its story? And so of course, it's not the building itself that's gonna tell the story, it's the people who built the building, who know people who built the building, who experienced, lived in the building, took care of the building, played uh, in that building, and um, who, whose who's, uh, neighborhood was near that building and who experienced it from all these different perspectives. So from the get-go, the course was going to be based around this large project uh, with the students to build a collection to preserve the history and the memory of this iconic barn, this iconic arena in downtown St. Catharines. So um, the course itself, it was, as I mentioned, a full year course. 
And the first few uh, weeks was really all about, a, it was a crash course, course in oral history. What is oral history theory, methodology? Students were listening to other collections online and in, in, the, uh, in special collections at Brock University. They were reading about um, how you analyze oral history, how you use them in your research, um, some of the challenges of using them, some of the benefits of using them. They also were doing uh, research on the Garden City Arena itself in the archives. They also met with um, Kathy Powell, who's a curator at the St. Catharines Museum and who was one of our uh, partners in this project. They met with her and toured the, arch or the archive in the museum. They also worked with a lot of the images that are on the St. Catharines Museum's digital repository, a lot of amazing photographs. So documents, photographs, but also familiarizing themselves with the arena itself. And so we had a fantastic tour of the arena, courtesy of John Lowe from the city of St. Catharines. We also, um, uh, and, and sort of looking at a lot of the uh, various material, material culture contained within the arena itself. And a group of us even went to a Falcons hockey game one Friday night to experience the energy of, of the arena on, on a Friday night in uh, downtown St. Catharines. Okay. So the, co the course was really a combination of more, a more traditional course of readings and seminar and writing, but also this, this uh, experiential work integrated learning component as well. In the in November of, of uh, this of the November of the course, so November of 2021, the students organized what we called a community collecting event, and this was an event where the community was invited to come to the arena and share their memorabilia, their photographs, their ephemera. So ephemera is everything from ticket stubs to programs to posters, as well as any other any objects that had meaning to them or to just bring a story and a memory. And so students recorded stories, we scanned objects, photographed objects, scanned documents, and, and we had a fantastic turnout. John Hewitt was there as well. And oh, and I wanted to also thank John Hewitt who also came and spoke to our students as well. We had a couple of guest speakers come in and talk about doing oral history and how to interview and thinking about um, how, how to conduct that interview and uh, and um, uh, the engagement that between the interviewee and the interviewer as well. So John Hewitt was there, and uh, we had a fantastic turnout. Dozens of um, of residents came out with their objects, their artifacts, their stories, their memories, and we um, uh, we had I think we interviewed um, almost 30 people. So these were short interviews where we asked people to share their um, fondest memory or most important memory of the arena. And we recorded these and uh, the students then edited them and then we they are available for you to listen to um, in the archive. Sometimes people uh, explained why they brought a particular object with them and the meaning behind that object. So we also have these, uh, these scanned or photographed artifacts with stories associated to them so that it's not just an object, the object has meaning through the story and uh, the, the memory of the person who brought it. And so it's a wonderful uh, com combination of, of, a, of a piece of um, you know, cu cultural artifact and that, that oral history piece as well. So that was the collecting event. And after the collecting event, students um, were also in the new year in, uh, conducted longer interviews and Paige is gonna talk a little bit about uh, one of the interviews that she conducted as part of that second phase of the collecting that we, that we did. And the students in the new year conducted these interviews. They found, uh, they interviewed people either who had, who had identified themselves already at the community event or had not been able to attend the event, but were very interested in sharing their story. And we also um, were able to talk to other people through what's called snowball methodology, which is when somebody that you interview then says, you know, I will get a hold of somebody else that I know who would be able to provide additional information about this or tell you another really great story to add to your collection. So uh, just to um, 
you know, some, some of the artifacts that we collected, uh, I think we, as a class, we would always sort of come together every week and talk about where we were in the project and, and some of the things that struck us. And we would reflect on what we'd learned up to then and what we still needed to do or some of the challenges that we had. But one of the really, one particularly fun class was when we had kind of brought all of these items together and they were now available for everybody to, to look at and, and search through. And we were all discussing what our favorite artifacts were our favorite stories that we collected were and one of the favorites and a lot of people found this uh, really the, their favorite artifact was a, a little program from the junior a falcon st catherine's falcons from january of 1945 and it was um, marvin cook who brought this in and i don't know if you can see it because i think that okay there we go i i have to you might have to move my image off of the screen you can kind of hover it and move it over but this is the falcons program and so on the inside this he, he shoots he scores is from the thorold um, ontario paper company and it's an ad but it's it's fantastic because it's all about how the reason that our boys are doing so well in the war is uh, because they play hockey. And so this connection between militarism and sporting prowess, as, as a historian of the Second World War, I, I thought that this was just amazing. But it is the inscription or the, or the, the, the writing inside this program that makes this document really unique because there are other versions of this. I've seen it in other collections. This is not an especially valuable or rare piece of ephemera, but this inscription is just, it, it, I think everybody in the class just thought it was amazing. So, so Marvin Cook brought this in, but the inscription reads, Marvin Cook went to this hockey game for the first time in his life at the age of four and three quarter years and saw two periods before he asked to be taken home to go to sleep. And I think that everyone who has been to either a hockey game or another sporting event with a small child or who has been to one themselves as a small child has had that exact same experience. But what a wonderful addition to this, um, this document. And, um, and I think that here, here's where the oral history is kind of the, that in itself. And, and Marvin actually talks uh, a little bit about this document and the meaning of it in his, in his interview. And so we have this in writing, but we also have his own voice telling us the, the importance of this document to him. So that was one of our favorite documents, but there are so many wonderful, wonderful uh, items in our collection. And please, please, please take a look at it. it uh, the photographs that people brought in, the items and, and telling us why these were meaningful to them. And so here is a one screenshot of some of the interviews. If you click on one of these icons, one of these photographs, you'll be taken to an interview uh, to, to listen to it. Um, at the end, um, when, when we finished our presentation, I can, uh, I'll share a different screen and I can kind of show you how to navigate your way through the, the website if you want, if there is time at the end. But, uh, but some fantastic stories. Uh, fantastic interviews. We learned so much about St. Catharines, about the community, about the, the, the role of this arena in the community. And, uh, and, and so when I think about um, the course itself, and as, an, as a university professor, one of the things that we always have to do is we have to talk about our course learning outcomes and what our students are going to learn from a course. And so on the one hand, I, I had a list of sort of very, very standard things that you would learn in a fourth year history seminar. So things like appraising major historic historiogra historiographic methodological debates in the field of oral history, to demonstrate critical thinking, reading, writing skills in accordance with the pursuit of a humanities education, which include analytic skills in the reading of primary and secondary historical sources but also things like demonstrating skills of collaboration and leadership, demonstrating professionalism, demonstrating skills in digital humanities as well. And I, I have to also uh, give a huge shout out to my student, Kat Rice, who is the one who eventually took all of this material that the students had gathered, the interviews that they had recorded and, uh, and um, edited and created um, indexes and timestamps and metadata, all this material that the students had collected and analyzed. 
Um, and she she put it all together on our website. And also uh, one of the things that the students did is that they also had to think about, well, how is it that people are going to engage with this material? It's one thing to have everything just plopped like you like an archive, you go into an archive and just find material and, and try to make sense of it. But I also wanted uh, the students to think about, well, how could we present this material in a way that's perhaps a little bit more user friendly? And this is where that, that more sort of public history came in, which was the creation of exhibits. And so this is where more of that, uh, where, where there was that additional component too in those learning outcomes of thinking about public history and how the public engages with the past and how, and in this case also how the community can engage in that past and what we're sharing and giving back to the community. Because ultimately what we were doing was preserving that history, but being able to give it back to the community so that the community could then enjoy it. And so the students, um, what we did is we, we really thought about, okay, we have dozens and dozens and dozens, almost a hundred artifacts, and we have over 30 interviews. And, and everybody's sharing these different things and people don't have time to listen to every interview or look at every single document. Is there a way that we can create exhibits that highlight some of the central themes that have come out of the work that we've done in the collection that we've created? And so students created a series of exhibits um, and we've, we've organized them along sort of chronological but also thematic lines. And so again, um, if you, you're welcome to browse the collection, to listen to the interviews, but you can also, if you're interested interested in a particular theme or um, uh, or topic, you can also go and look at one of these amazing exhibits. And so one of them is all about what was at the gardens, the site of the Garden City prior to the arena being there. And I think Dennis Gannon, I think you'll find that one especially interesting. Uh, but also sort of the construction, the building of the arena. Um, the, of course, so much of the stuff that we got for the arena had to do with hockey, playing hockey, organizing hockey, the CYO, the Falcons, Stan Makita, the big hockey heroes of St. Catharines. But a lot of the, what, a, so another theme that really came through was the importance of community, the importance of family, and so, um, and, and growing up in the arena and what that space means. Um, so, so that's uh, one of my favorite is, is the, is, and it's very moving, the, the growing up in the Garden City Arena. There's one about fundraising and the various ways in which the arena was a focal point for fundraising at the arena. I don't want to give too much away. I want you to, to be able to explore it, but just wanted to, to kind of highlight uh, some of the, the, these exhibits and the ways in which the students brought together all of this material. Uh, two students actually created podcasts, so you, if you wanted to listen to, to a, an oral exhibit, those podcasts are also embedded within those exhibits. So coming back to those learning outcomes that I started by, by mentioning, a lot more came out of this course beyond just those more standard typical outcomes. I think that one of the, the things that really struck me, and we, we had a, a pretty um, significant debrief at the end of, of the course, um, was that the students really gained a deeper understanding of local history and of the history of St. Catharines. And many of them really had, didn't know very much at all, um, even those who are from, from the region or from the city. They also recognized the value of working with the community on these types of projects. They also felt an incredible sense of pride in what they had accomplished and an incredible sense of confidence, a new confidence in the skills and their new abilities. And so many of our students were so nervous about engaging in these interviews. And once they'd done it, realized, wow, I can, it wasn't nearly as scary as I thought. I think this is something that I can that I can do and that I want to do, and I really enjoy doing it. And I think I'm actually really good at it. And so it also, in many ways, created a, a really strong sense of belonging that these students who may only be here for a few years or, or are going to stay really felt that they were now part of the community. So uh, that's um, just a few things about sort of the history and background of this. Paige, I hope I've given you enough time. I think you still have about 25 minutes. I'll be um, good. That you'll be good. Okay, great. So um, uh, if you have any questions after Paige, Paige is gonna tell you some really awesome stories that have that came out of the work that she did on this project. But, um, and, and there hopefully will be time for questions as well if you have any. And I can also show you how to navigate your way through 
the uh, the collection. So Paige, on to you. Sure. Yes. Can Can you hear me? Okay. My mic is working. Okay. Great. So yes, I'm I'm Paige. I'm a graduate student at Brock. I was uh, in Dr. Vlasak's fourth year oral history class last year, and um, I was one of those students who a didn't really have much of an interest in local history, let alone to be quite honest, St. Catherine's local history. I'm not, I'm not from Niagara. Um, and, and I also had never ever really engaged with oral history before either doing oral history or using it as a, as a primary source. I really, up until last year, had only really used uh, written primary sources that I was finding in our institutional archives. Um, so I was, I was really intimidated. Uh, to use oral history, but kind of like Dr. Vosak explained, we spent a lot of time uh, learning the theory behind oral history, learning uh, how to how to prepare to do oral history interviews, how to use them, how to conduct them, what to do with them after the fact, and again, thinking about how you can present this kind of material to the public, and also how you preserve it for future historians. And it was actually that bit about preserving uh, material for future historians that really, I think, uh, helped me understand how important oral history is. And, and I remember we, we read in, in one of our books about how, you know, modern communications and modern transportation has made things like letter writing and diary keeping obsolete in a way. And I was thinking about how often those are the sources that I depend on when I'm doing my own research and how, you know, what kind of sources are historians in the future going to have? Um, and, and that to me was, was just another reason to really reinforce the value of oral history. Um, but like Dr. Vlasic said, in, in this class, we had the opportunity to conduct an oral history interview and also to, you know, produce something that would be contributing to uh, the, the online exhibit that we created. And when we were kind of figuring out what we wanted to work on, I knew I wanted to do something physical, something that had to do with the community and the landscape, uh, mostly because I currently live in the kind of neighborhoods straddling the downtown and, and Queenston neighborhood very, very close to the arena. Um, and also because of my background, I um, really like using digital tools like GIS or geographic information systems. So I decided that I was going to take oral history, which is a, a digital tool and pair it together with another uh, digital history tool, GIS. Thank you. I keep forgetting I need to remind you to do my slides for me. So. Um, what I'm going to kind of talk about today is two case studies, uh, two examples of, of things that I, I learned through this whole process. But before doing that, I kind of want to just uh, introduce everyone to what GIS is. So I was using historical GIS or historical geographic information systems, which is essentially a methodology that historians can use to emphasize the spatial context uh, for historical events places and people. Uh, a GIS could be, you know, Google Maps is a GIS. Um, any, any type of online digital interactive map is essentially a form of, of a GIS. And it's a tool I really like to use for a couple of reasons. First, because it allows you to analyze history in a spatial context, and that can reveal patterns that tell us about the impacts that events or people or places have on a physical landscape, especially in an urban setting. Um, it's also a tool that can let you analyze really big data sets, uh, which is just very convenient. Um, but another thing I really love about it is that it allows for a really great way to visualize and to share historic data with people in an interactive way. So essentially what I decided to do for my project was figure out a way to map out something. I didn't know what, but I knew I was going to map out something in the in relation to the Garden City Arena and the Queenston and the downtown community. So when we were figuring out who we were going to interview, um, there was a gentleman named Jerome who was interested in being interviewed because he had grown up in the Queenston community. And I immediately dibs to that, which there was a lot of that happening in this class because um, we were all very excited 
I did this to him and I said, I'm interviewing him. I want to know more about this neighborhood and what it was like to grow up and what the space felt like. And, you know, how does that compare to how the space feels now? So I prepared as best I could uh, and, and looked into, you know, tried to figure out what this space looked like uh, when, when he would have been a child. What does it look like now? What are some questions I can ask that really, you know, try to get me some information because at this point I really didn't know what was going to be um, what I was going to put on a map. Um, and when I interviewed him, I noticed right away that he was making all of these connections with the arena and other businesses in the Queenston and downtown area. You know, he would mention he would go from here to here or he would go um, for, like he would uh, get his skate sharpened at one place and he would have dinner at another place or, you know, his parents would go to the Queensway Hotel and all these other businesses. And I shared that um, with my peers after the interview in, in class. And I learned right away that a lot of my peers were um, experiencing the same thing. They were also having people tell them about the connections they had, not only between them and the arena, but the arena and other businesses. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to find these businesses, I'm going to map them, and I'm going to you know, show the, the relationship between them. And that's how this kind of this map on the screen came to be. So these red points are businesses that I thought were primary businesses uh, connected to the arena. So these are businesses that multiple people talked about in their interview. Uh, they had a very clear memory that connected the arena and the business. And then there are businesses of interest, which are maybe less primary. Um, a lot of them have to do with personal memories between the people we interviewed but I thought were worth representing. And the green locations we're gonna talk about a little later. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So the map uh, is fully interactable. And if you click on a point, it, it pops up a little um, info about it, which for me is behind my own face, but if you can see it, uh, it, it gives the title of the place, it gives a, a light description of what's happening there. There's a memory, uh, which is a transcription of an oral history um, interview. And then there's also some photos as well and some other bibliographic data. So I, I, I really liked how it turned out. Obviously the Garden City Arena is the uh, big star on it. And I thought it did a good job of shaping, you know, uh, demonstrating the relationship these businesses had with the arena. And this is actually a perfect slide to be on to kind of explain my first um, case study, which is about Tony's Tasty Treats, which is a business that I have never been to and never will, but I feel very deeply connected to at this point. So Tony's Tasty Treats, which was also called Tasty Treat, and Tasty Treat was spelt about five or six different ways uh, while it existed. It served as a gathering place and an eatery for the St. Catharines community. And after hockey games at the Garden City Arena, it would be crowded with young spectators celebrating the game with food. And this was something that I first learned about in Jerome's interview. And I shared it with the class. Um, and a few other people had actually heard of either Tasty Treat or there was another name floating around called Tasty Freeze. And um, I became really interested in how, you know, what this business was. So I used kind of the same process for all the businesses on this map, which was I first looked at the city directories, found the business, tracked it through year to year, see is the business still there? Did it move? Is it closed? Um, and I was able to identify it, but I wasn't able to find any other real evidence of its existence other than in the city directories and in people's memories. But the thing was people's memories were so strong about this business. People remembered it so fondly, you know, they remembered the exact food that was there. Uh, multiple, multiple people had mentioned it. And I really didn't want to just give up. Um, I looked for advertisements in the newspaper. I looked for articles about it in the newspaper. I looked for photos where I was finding photos of other businesses. Uh, the St. Catharines Library Special Collections has a uh, like a business, like has these binders full of historic businesses. I looked through those. I even looked through the St. Catharines 
uh, library's total collection of Dennis Gannon's Yesterday and Today, hoping that maybe it had been covered. And I actually even, Dennis sent you an email, which you answered very politely saying, I'm sorry, I don't know the business. So I really did what I, I was lifting up every rock. Um, and I kind of felt pretty bummed that I wasn't able to find anything. But then I decided, you know, it was time to really crowdsource. So I joined uh, the St. Catherine's Vintage Facebook group. You can go to the next slide. And um, I posted on Facebook in that group. And I, I made this post saying, you know, I'm looking for Tony's Tasty Treats, please. Someone help me. I've made this my life mission at this point. Um, and immediately there was just so many positive comments. And these comments were really reinforcing the same things I was hearing in uh, that I heard in my interview and my peers interviews as well, you know, they remembered uh, Tony's tasty treats. He was so nice, you know, it was across from the Queensway Hotel. It's up the street from the arena. Oh, the food was so good. There's a lot of people who wanted to follow along. They wanted to see photos, but I still wasn't getting any more confirmation or like a photo or other proof that it existed. And then finally, I got a comment, which is on the next slide. I got this fantastic comment that, you know, said, Tony's Tasty Treats was owned by Tony Montefiore, which I did. I knew an A Montefiore had owned it, and Anthony from the um, city directories. Um, and in this, he talks about uh, Tony's orange VW bug. So being a child of the internet, I looked on Facebook, I found a Tony Montefiore that had an orange VW bug in his Facebook profile picture. And I added him on Facebook and I sent him a message explaining who I was and, and asking if he was the owner of Tony's Tasty Treats. And um, I did not get an answer, which is unsurprising because I too do not answer uh, Facebook messages from strangers. So <laughs> can't blame him for that. So next what I did was decide to try to reach out to his son, Mark, Mark Montefiore, who according to this post uh, is a movie producer. So I found him on LinkedIn and I, with all of my five LinkedIn connections, uh, added him and sent him a message explaining who I was explaining that people remembered his father's business really fondly and hoping that he would want to talk to me. And he answered right away and he gave me his phone number. I gave him a call and literally it was like one of the best moments of my life. And I'm pretty sure that's actually exactly what I told Dr. Blasak when I, we finally got to celebrate that I, that I had uncovered this business and Mark shared a lot of other memories with me. Um, he didn't want to be interviewed. So I, we don't have those recorded. Um, but he also shared some fantastic photos with me, which I will show you on the next slide. So the black and white photo, that is Tony uh, serving soft serve ice cream, which was remembered very fondly there. Uh, the bottom photo is the is the restaurant. Of course, this is, if you were to drive by this now, it's at 17 slash 19 Queenston. It is a, it's an empty lot now. There's nothing there. And then also some of the... Um, menus from their opening day, which interesting enough, a lot of people had talked about these turbo subs that he would make and, you know, here they are right on the menu. So not only was this incredibly vindicating for me, but, <laughs> but also it really made me think about the value of oral history interviews because I realized this was a business and, and memories, part of St. Catherine's collective memory, really, uh, that was completely missing from our institutional archives, other than in the city directories, there was no other inkling or, or piece of evidence that this business existed. And I do wonder if it wasn't for, you know, these oral history interviews, if this business maybe would have slipped away and, and not have been remembered by the community and been gone in a generation or two, you know, the building is physically gone. Um, so I thought that was a really good example of the value of oral history. So we'll do my next little um, case study here, which is about a business that was much easier to find in the archives. So Bob Patrick's Cycle and Sport 
uh, it started as a service station uh, that serviced small engines and bicycles in the 1940s at some point, and then grew into a larger enterprise. And they started selling sports equipment like ice skates, uh, but they also primarily mostly sold bicycles. And we had a lot of people mention this business. Jerome had mentioned it as well, but we had other folks mentioning it, especially about skate sharpening and getting their um, hockey sticks and hockey equipment. And there was, I remember this one uh, interview where the gentleman said, you know, he just watched the sparks fly everywhere and then he would grab his skates and run back to the arena. Um, so this business I could find a lot of evidence of. They published uh, a lot of advertisements in the, in the St. Catherine Standard. They, when they celebrated anniversaries, there was articles published in the newspaper. So that wasn't really an issue. But what I did notice when I was going through the city directories was that Bob Patrick's moved a lot. And I kind of sat there thinking, do I want to include all of these locations on the map? You know, on one hand, you want to balance. You don't want a map to look cluttered. You want to tell a whole story, though, you know, when you're making a map or when you're doing an oral history interview, you're really curating in some ways the story you're telling and you don't want to you know, put too much of your own into it. And I ended up deciding that I was going to include all of the locations since the Garden City Arena had opened because I couldn't really be the judge of who was using the arena um, and who had a connection to the arena and Bob Patrick's and when. Um, so I mapped them all and those are the green points on the map because I wanted them to be differentiated from the other businesses. So I put all this in my computer, plopped it on the map, and this is what showed up. So um, Bob Patrick's was originally on Garden Park in the 40s and, and most of the 1950s. And then it moved to Academy Street in 1957, where it stayed until 1961. And then it moved again to St. Paul Street, where it stayed until 1964, until moving just across the street, where it remained until 1994. And when I saw this on the map, I immediately recognized a pattern. And that pattern was that with every move, uh, Bob Patrick's was getting closer to the arena. Now, I, of course, did not jump to the conclusion that, oh, it must be because of the arena. You know, it could be because, you know, they were getting a better rent deal or the space fit better, or maybe they wanted to be closer to competition. You know, Herzog's is also on that street, which also did skate sharpening. Um, but the pattern that's very clear here, I feel like was powerful enough to warrant further investigation into, you know, the relationship between Bob Patrick's and the Garden City Arena. Of course, I have not been able to really go deeper into this, mostly because, of course, our course was only one year, unfortunately, which I don't think people say very often about their courses. <laughs> but um what I think this is a great example of is the value of GIS as, as a digital tool. I really, really doubt that I would have picked up on this pattern had I just had this information in a graph or had I just had this information, you know, written out in my notes or wrote about it. So I think this is a really good example um, to explain how GIS is a powerful tool for analyzing and 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 seeing patterns that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And that kind of, those are essentially my two um, case studies, which kind of brings me to two or three concluding thoughts about what I really learned through this experience and, and what I think is, is really important to share with other people. One, well, I guess encompassingly, I think the value of, of digital tools for public history is really clear here. For oral history, um, I think it, it, it's quite clear that oral history interviews can reveal really significant forgotten local histories like Tony's Tasty Treats, which I know is a very simple example. But again, people have such fond memories of this place and I can't help but imagine um, how it would have been lost since it's not in our institutional archives. Um, also GIS, you know, GIS can reveal patterns that really help us understand 
the spatial context for our local history. And it's also a great way to share history with the community in a visual and, and interactive way. And, and this is a quite basic map, you know, it's not incredibly sophisticated, but it still tells a story. And I know that learning digital history tools like doing oral history or GIS can be really intimidating, but the value that they add to researching and presenting local histories is really significant, I think. And I think especially for junior scholars like myself, um, digital history methods are becoming a tool that we are prioritizing more and more, mostly because, well, for, for a number of reasons, but some of which I would say are because it is an opportunity for telling more inclusive and interactive stories, uh, but it also allows us to investigate you know, more diverse historical narratives and, and more community-based histories that, that we can tell without having to fully rely on the material that exists in our archives. Like Dr. Vlasek said, there's a lot of people's histories and stories that are missing from those. And I would really encourage, I mean, really anyone, but also organizations like the St. Catharines Historical Society, or any organization that works with local history to try to incorporate digital history into their methodology. And I totally understand that it is time consuming to learn. It is intimidating. But there's also a really big community of digital historians um, who are more often than not very willing to help. And I also know that groups you know, like the St. Catharines Historical Society are interested in recruiting some younger members as well. And this is, I've worked a little bit with the Niagara on the Lake Historical Society as well, and this is something they talk about a lot as well. And I think by um, including and incorporating digital methods into your work, um, you know, it would it'd probably be able to really help foster and develop working relationships with younger audiences. And I mean, what's not to love about digital history really? <laughs> That's really all I have to say. Thanks, Paige. Are there any um, questions? Should I start the, is there time for questions? Sure, yeah, I can, I can moderate this. If there's any uh, questions, what you can do is, let me just see if I can, uh, see the gallery here yeah we could start if so if you could start by putting up your virtual hand or your put up your hand virtually and i can call you um we can start with that i'm just trying to see if i see any uh oh i see uh gail i'll just uh mute, unmute myself that yeah. was terrific piece of work. Um, I know nothing about sports at all. And uh, I've lived here for 50 years or something like that. Um, terrific research. Thank you so much. All I can say is thank you so much. So the, the visuals were terrific. I remember seeing the old Queenston Hotel, everything. It's just great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. There were a lot of students in the class who were had no interest in sports. And um, and and I think that one of the things that's and this is something too that the sport oral history is all about is that yes it is a sport oral history archive but I think that sport is is a fantastic sort of lens or or um, like jumping off point for exploring all sorts of different aspects of history and and so in many ways our our archive yes there's a lot of hockey in it but there's a lot of other things in it too and and I think that it's a way to um, to explore uh, how how a city has evolved over time, how how it, you know the, the history of urbanization, of industrialization, of deindustrialization, of class relations, um, of gender, of uh, community building. Uh, one one of the fantastic stories that we had was from um, a former nurse who was involved in a. A fundraising event at the Garden City Arena in the 19, early 1980s, I think it was 1981, and it was to raise money to buy the first MRI machine for the St. Catharines General. And mm -hmm. so that also then all of a sudden we're looking at public health history 
and the history of, of, of medicine and technology and medicine. And, and it's a really, uh, it was a really amazing, um, rich, rich way of, of thinking about all these different stories and components that make up the history of a, of a community and of a city. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Very much so. Thank you. Uh, questions. Uh, is it Paul, your hands up? Yeah. Yeah. I was very involved with the um, Winter Club of St. Catharines. And I guess I can say I was a little disappointed that uh, figure skating was not ever mentioned uh, during my time, which was about 28 years, very involved with figure skating. Uh, we occupied the arena for approximately 35 hours a week. And uh, during the heyday, which was actually uh, part of the time I was there, um, we had Barbara Ann Scott uh, skating for some of our shows etc. So, uh, and I know the, uh, when I basically retired from the Winter Club, all our records were given to the museum. So I'm sure if anybody wants any history on the Winter Club, uh, the museum would have that information. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I apologize, I didn't mention that there is actually an exhibit about the Winter Club in the collection. So um, we did interview a couple of people. Um, Jane Rizzo, who is a member of the Winter Club. We also yeah, interviewed. Um, yeah, she was a coach. We interviewed Leslie Thorburn, who is our oldest interviewee. Um, and we also um, have a few um, other contri contributions and some photo, some figure skating photographs. So um, it's not it's not nearly as extensive as the hockey. But um, but there is there is some some um, material in there and um, but I would I would love more so uh, I would love to get more contributions from the from the Winter Club. Monty Fiore, the one who had the tasty three, uh, his daughters skate were very active figure skaters. Uh, any other questions? I'm just scanning my gallery here to see. Oh, Dennis. Oh, I think you're on mute still, Dennis. Talk about, talk about comfort with digital matters. <laughs> <laughs> Not showing it now, am I? Um, I enjoyed your presentation very much. I enjoyed your enthusiasm for uh, for the course and uh, your uh, enjoyment of uh, discovering suddenly discovering the history of St. Catharines, uh, in this this community this community into which uh, uh, you have perhaps been transplanted for the purpose of going to Brock University. Uh, I have a I'm, I'm going to pass along a few suggestions. Uh, I, I Fortunately, I have a friend who used to who grew up in the I'm sure the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, living about halfway down Division Street between uh, between Calvin and uh, I guess Phelps or whatever it's called now. Uh, she also was uh, herself very much involved in softball locally, very much interested in sports. Uh, I want to put you in touch with her. I think she'd be a great interview for you. Um, and also the passing comment uh, from uh, from I guess Elizabeth uh, about the 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 history of the area before there was a an arena. Uh, I've recently come to learn a little bit about that. Um, in that uh, for a while around 1920, it, it, the area was being considered as uh, as the place where they would build the brand new St. Catherine's Collegiate. Uh, it, it lost the struggle for the collegiate, but uh, but there was a good deal of talk about that. I'd love to see whatever photographs you've got about that area before the arena. Um, uh, and uh, I do have one good photograph, which I included in one of my articles, a good photograph of the uh, Riordan House, which was there, which I, I'm sure you have, you've got that material. Uh, but a, a great house to belong to a, a local uh, 
a paper manufacturer. So anyway, there are a few things I, I, I'm going to try to channel to, toward you in the, in the near future. And um, and uh, to Paige, don't give up. Don't give up on, on me, Paige. I, I, I came up empty for you uh, once, but uh, trust me. Ask it. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, uh, I just recently got a photograph of a um, of a car dealership that used to, to operate out of that same uh, pro, pro area where the, um, the, the the Tasty Freeze or the soft ice cream place was. I'll pass that along to you and you can sort of tie it into the history of that of that whole corner. Uh, a photograph of, of what, the way it looked in 1934. Uh, anyway, that's all I've got for tonight. Thanks again for the very interesting presentation. Thank, thanks, Dennis. This is great because actually my next collection that I really want to do is the women's women's softball collection so that would be a fantastic starting point well the person who whom i want to introduce you to in fact has put out put out a, pro, a couple of volumes on women's softball here in town oh i've read them they're up in uh, special collections yeah maggie Likovec. i've got yes. a, i've got an email address for her in toronto fantastic. If, if, if in fact you don't have it already you may maybe you've made a contact with her i haven't made a contact with her but I've, i i'm familiar with her books i was i was using them with my students last year so You'll yeah. have her. Your, you'll have her email by later on tonight. So Excellent, I, thank I, you. I promise. Um, the the story of the Phelps or the the Riordan House though was was really um, really fascinating and quite complicated because it was actually the Phelps estate prior to it being the Riordan estate. Right. And so I had a student last spring going through special collections trying to trace exactly who whose home it was because it's known as the Riordan House, but it was actually the Phelps estate. And it shows up on the fire insurance maps from the from you know the 1903 I think. There's actually a little drawing of the estate in oh, the yeah. fire insurance map, but right. I couldn't find an actual. I found one photograph in the St. Catharines Public Library of it, and I think it was already the Riordan House by that point. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh... So it was quite a quite a quite a, a struggle to figure out exactly and all sorts of strange things happened to the families and Riordan fell on hard times and got into some shady business and it's quite quite a tale uh, well yeah there's not a, there's not a lot on that not a, a lot of uh, visual documentation of that spot other than that one photograph and as you say the the, the fire insurance plans uh, mm -hmm. uh, but there were a few photographs in the paper of what it looked like uh, when they were considering it as a location for the um, for the collegiate mm -hmm. but pretty difficult to deal with you know newspaper photographs are pretty murky sometimes yeah I'd love to see them okay okay thank you Okay, just see any more questions? I'm just going to scan and see if I see any. If, if there aren't any questions, do you want me to share my um, screen so you can sort of see the website and I can just sure. kind of walk walk people through it? Because it, we, we have a little um, like a, a little explanation for how to I can actually uh, let's see. Uh, where is it? Oh, of course, now I can't find it. Um, I can't find it anymore. No. It, I don't think it, it'll let me share. It's not letting me share my, uh, okay. Uh, that's okay. If you go to the, to, the, to the Sport Oral History Archive, you'll be able to figure it out. Um, I wanted to sort of show you how the how the oral history interviews work, but yeah. Now, how, how would I get to that archive if I would just look on the internet? Just what would I hit as a Google um, search or something? So it's sportoralhistory.ca. Okay. And then you can go into the Garden City Arena collection, and mm -hmm. then you can look at you can browse it through. You can browse memories, images interviews and exhibits and there's still and we also are still crowdsourcing so if anybody wants to contribute either a photograph or or just a written memory uh we're still accepting uh donations donations contributions to the to the archive uh gail you have a question can you put you can you put that up on on the chat so yeah. that we can yeah so that we can follow it and you know copy it and 
Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'll let you um, put that up on, yeah, if you could just put that on the chat or on the chat uh, space there, our members can get that and take a look. Uh, seeing no other questions, there's just, just a few parting comments uh, from me as we conclude. Just want to say this was actually quite uh, enlightening for me. I did uh, a history degree at University of Toronto, just undergrad, about 25 years ago, I would have graduated. And I can say just seeing what, what you're doing now and where things left off, I could just, there's, I, I missed a lot. A lot has changed in 25 years. And it's really interesting to see. It's actually really eye-opening to see how technology has changed the way we look at history. It, for me, it's been completely eye-opening and I'll definitely take um, uh, the, the, as a suggestion to send the, the way to get younger people with digital history. I think the historical society, that's something we definitely got to look at. And I think that's, that's great advice. And like I said, it's been really eye-opening for me to, to see that and hear how history has changed as a result of technology. And the other thing too, you got to look with it. We know artificial intelligence coming along, who knows how it'll change in the years to come. I can't even imagine it. I don't think anyone really fully understands how having that technology will change the methodologies for understanding history in the years to come. So anyways, a lot, lot to look forward to, a lot has changed. Um, so I do want to thank you both uh, for being here. I do want to mention just a couple of comments you'll see there. First of all, the, the link is in the uh, chat. Um, Stephanie just had a comment saying, Liz and Paige, this was fantastic. Thank you. And I guess I would be uh, not doing my duties if I didn't say happy birthday, Paige. <laughs> Who would have known, but uh, it's uh, someone's put it out. But uh, anyways, thanks to you both. Like I said, real, I think it was a really good job. We learned a lot from it. And the society, I think, uh, has learned a lot from that as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our, our work with you. All right. Well, thank you then. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.